Our talk today will be presented by Dr. Parviz Hosseini. He is a senior research fellow at EcoHealth Alliance. He has earned his Bachelor of Science in Applied Math and Biology sorry, from Brown University and his PhD in Biological Science from the University of California, Santa Barbara. He has conducted postdoctoral research at Cornell University and was an associate research scientist or er, scholar at Princeton University before moving to EcoHealth Alliance. His work focuses on the study of vector-borne pathogens. As a mathematician and ecologist, Dr. Hassini uses his critical modeling skills to understand how these diseases are transmitted from animal to animal as well as animal to human. Within EcoHealth Alliance, Dr. Hassini works in programs discovering emerging disease hotspots, identifying potential infectious disease threats, as well as setting viral pathways to understand how future outbreaks can be prevented or contained. So with that, I'll pass it over. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about understanding the ideas of um, land use change, which I'm going to sort of talk about a little bit later in my talk, and the ecological community structure and pathogen emergence. And the idea here is to sort of really work on understanding how community structure and multi-host systems multi-host pathogen systems really sort of interesting. So my background is as really a theoretical ecologist, so um, I'm doing a lot of math. There will be some scary equations, but I don't expect you to understand them all as I go through them rapidly in the slides. Um, but I will try to read through them. I've been worked a lot on the emergence of diseases well at EcoHealth Alliance, and particularly some work on avian influenza. Um, and I'm currently going to show you, I'm um, working on Rift Valley Fever, and I'm going to show you some of that ongoing work. I've also done some work on the global transportation of disease, so uh, as Dr. Paul Gibbs talked about earlier, some of this airplane flight connectivity of how you can get around the world in less than 24 hours. Um, I have a funny story about that um, with a colleague from Bank leaving Bangladesh at the same time, going the opposite ways and meeting up at Eagle Health Alliance at out of different elevators. Um, and then also, um, I've worked on barley and cereal yellow dwarf viruses, complex, which is an aphid-borne um, virus of grass species, and I also previously worked on um, house switch conjunctivitis or mycoplasma of yellow um, And so I'm going to talk a lot today about how does, how does diseases affect um, an ecological community, how is disease affected or controlled by other members of the community, and how does the anthropogenic change of ecological community alter these infectious diseases. And I think these are some really critical aspects of disease ecology to begin to understand. And I think the other way I've also become sort of recently realized is that I'd really like to see the field move forward is to think about how we can restore or manage that function when impacts happen. So I'm briefly going to talk about Rift Valley Fever and show some preliminary modeling work uh, uh, that focuses on how host population and turnover um, and can really lead to different outcomes for diseases and dynamics, and how this might provide some insight into the differential management of a landscape. Um, and then I'm really going to segue into sort of some direct land use change work um, I've done, um, and with um, some colleagues from, um, um, including some data from colleagues in Mexico. Um, and then, so I'm going to start with the Rift Valley Fever right now. So Rift Valley fever is a mosquito-borne virus, so for those of you not familiar with it, the Rift Valley is the, um, a mountainous cleavage along the eastern edge of Africa, sort of along the border between um, Uganda, Tanzania, um, and Kenya is sort of a heart of it, but it goes all along that border system all the way down towards South Africa and up into Ethiopia. Um, so Rift Valley fever virus is a mosquito-borne virus, it's part of the Bunyaviridae, which is a plebo-virus. The Bunyaviridae are a really interesting family because there are both um, plant pathogens and mammal pathogens in it, and it's suspected that it might actually be originally a, a, um, a virus of insects themselves that have spread into the things that they feed on. Um, it's transmitted both by Culex mosquitoes, which have larger populations and greater response to flooding, um, and Aedes mosquitoes, which in key have a really high level of transovial transovarial transmission. And so that means that the transovarial transmission simply means that the mosquito can uptake the virus as an adult while feeding. That is actually the virus can then be passed on to the egg 
and stored in the egg, and then when the adult the mosquito goes to the larval stages and emerges, and the virus can survive through all those stages and then be spread out of the mosquito when it fights again on hatching. And this is really important with Aedes mosquitoes because they have desiccation-resistant eggs, so you can essentially get a seed bank effect of the virus in these desiccation-resistant eggs, which can be pretty important for this system. It's also transmitted by, um, to a lesser extent, by um, Anopheles and biting flies, and I think there's a lot of geographical variation in exactly what vectors are important, and also a lot of those vector species are sort of understudied still at this point. So, in the symptoms in livestock are acute fe febrile illness um, and fetal loss, so it's a, a more deficient, so a lot of the cattle that have, when there's a big outbreak, one of the big issues is that there's a lot of the cat if the cattle are pregnant or the sheep and goats particularly as well, that there'll be a lot of loss of um, um, fetuses, and that actually creates a huge sanitation issue. Um, and then there's about 10% mortality in adults as well, and greater than 90% juvenile mortality. And a big issue with the spillover risk is that the, um, there's a low persistent risk of spillover to humans, so a large part of it is thought to actually come from butchering sick animals and from handling the sanitation from the aborted fetuses. Um, but we can't rule out mosquito-borne transmission to um, humans as well, because really, you know, when there's mosquitoes biting you while you're cleaning up aborted fetuses and slaughtering animals, it's like, how do you know how you exactly got it? Um, and so I think that's one of these things that's often tricky with these things, is the, often with transmission, we really know what seems most likely, what's most probable to happen, but we can't always rule out some of the improbable ones either. Um, and so what I'm interested in is really how is it maintained in wild, um, but in the case of South Africa, we're often focused on ranch wildlife. So South Africa, a lot of wildlife um, exists in the natural parks and is not slaughtered, but a lot of the, um, there are actually a lot of wildlife that are maintained on private lands, and they're actually regularly slaughtered um, for either meat or um, skins or what have you. Um, and it's just sort of part of the process of actually how they maintain them, but they do may contain them for much longer lives than you typically graze livestock. Um, and we also look interested in how it's maintained in domestic ungulates, and how this ungulate community might shape the dynamics of what happens with the disease. And right now this modeling effort is still in the preliminary stages, so the parameterizations are not finalized, and not all the scenarios are interested are finalized. So I'm just going to show you a few look-sees into this today. Um, so the model equations, so I'm just going to try and go through this reasonably quickly and get you the big functional ideas. So we have susceptible juveniles and um, su susceptible adults, and then infected adults and recovered adults. We don't model the infected juveniles because we just assume that they get infected and they just die. So we get to drop them out of the bookkeeping to simplify the equations. Um, and then we, from so individuals are born into the juvenile state. We also assume that the, there's no birth from the infected individuals because of abortion. We also have a term in here that's not going to use so much today for importation of individuals, um, particularly if you're interested in what happens with your belly and fever in a feedlot structure. Essentially, you're not having really localized births. You're having importation solely. Um, and then we have transmission out of susceptible class and then maturation out of the juvenile class. We then have the adults, so they maturing from the juvenile class, then there is the infection that moves them um, into the infected class, and then a background mortality rate. Again, here are our infections terms. Um, and then we have the, both the uh, infected Helix mosquitoes and infected Aedes mosquitoes. And then um, we have an additional background mortality and a recovery rate. And we have recovered individuals and a mortality rate. And so it's really, in some ways, this background mortality co covered with this sort of immunity term that sort of changes the dynamics from species to species because of different rates of turnover in the species we work with. We also, so we have the Culex mosquitoes, they just have a reproductive rate that is um, forced seasonally, and I'll show you the, what that looks like. And then they infect the ruminants and um, have a mortality rate, and then the infect, so these are just an SI, so susceptible Helix mosquitoes, infected Helix mosquitoes, and sort of then the infectedness, the mosquitoes becoming infected and dying here. 
The ABs equations are much more complicated because we have susceptible adults, um, susceptible eggs, infected adults, and infected eggs. And this egg stage, again, what is the main part here is this can really keep the disease persisting in the system for long periods of time. So this is just what, in sort of Julian days, so that's days basically from January 1st, um, what the seasonal mosquito dynamics look like, there's essentially the onset of the rainy seasons, the Aedes eggs hatch out and sort of decline rapidly, and then the Culex mosquitoes are sort of existing, they both exist at sort of somewhat low levels in the dry season in our model, and then sort of pop up again in the rainy season with the Culex coming in a little bit later. This is sort of roughly fitted to some available field data, from the early 80s. <coughs> but then the mosquito dynamics are also affected by um, El Nino and, and so events. Um, There's actually in East Africa and Kenya, which has been more well studied by Anyamba et al., it's actually during the El Nino years that East Africa is raining and then you get the big mosquito outbreaks. South Africa is actually flipped and the rainy years are the La Nina years. So we've got a very simple model where essentially we just boost the carrying capacity of the mosquito in the La Nina years. And this is actually using a, or the real time series of La Nina El Nino years, but simplified to just sort of binary yes or no, whether it's La Nina or not. Um, and then looking at the dynamics and how that relates to the sort of seasonality and sort of what happens with some of the interepidemic transmission, and also when you get these repeated series of years of of La Nina events. So this is looking at a kudu, um, which is a species that's stocked at about these densities of sort of around 100 animals. Um, and then we have the mosquito dynamics here. So these are sort of the keys here. So we've got the juvenile susceptibles in light green, the adult susceptibles in dark green, infected susceptibles in red, um, recovered, yeah, sorry, ah, this is a typo, sorry, adult host, uh, um, infected host, recovered host and um, total host. So this gray line is actually the total host abundance. And that's going to be pretty important to look at in some of the slides I want to point out to you, as well as sort of the blue line. We don't actually see that many infected individuals at any one time, partially because the infection is actually fairly acute and actually leads to mortality in so many individuals. Um, again, this is sort of the, um, so this is the mosquitoes. So the 80s are in blue and orange, and the culex are in blue and red. <coughs> And so again, you can sort of see that there's a real burst of mosquito abundance um, during the La Nina seasons. But what we're seeing here is it's really the first La Nina season, you get a pretty big epidemic and spike. But then you often skip the second one in this case, and maybe by the third or fourth year of La Nina, or if you've got a, a decent gap between them, then you get an epidemic again as well. But if you've also got a long, fairly dry spell, you still can get some inter-epidemic transmission but noticeably, right, the total population size fluctuates but stays fairly stable in this case. So this is spring rock. They can be actually kept at a much higher density. So in this case, we actually see, again, fairly stable dynamics uh, with most of the population remaining immune throughout, the, throughout all these epidemics. Um, but we do get more sort of epidemic periods and we get more burst of infected mosquitoes through here. So this really has importance for how this drives. So the idea here is this is probably closer to what happens in a natural system where most of the wild ungulates stay, are immune, and you actually have fairly, you have epidemics, but they're somewhat small and they're not really affecting the population that strongly. So here's the most dramatic change. And this is sheep. So one of the things in Africa, generally speaking, sheep and goats are raised much more for a meat production system with rapid turnover. Um, and sheep and goats also tend to be most vulnerable to uh, the um, domestic ungulate species to Rift Valley fever virus. And so what you see here is that you're getting fairly drastic redu market reductions and effects on the population size of sheep. And we're actually using sort of more pastoralist level um, abundances here. Um, we are interested in extending this to sort of the more industrial cases, but getting our parameters right so that they sort of work across all those cases is a bit tricky. 
Um, you can see again that much more of the sheep population is susceptible at any given time, um, except for right when you get the crashes of the epidemics, and that's what largely drives the population crashes, is losing all the susceptibles, and you get sort of this match between essentially the recovered individuals and the total population. And here you see you're getting much more epidemics during all the La Nina years. You know, if it's a second year, it's a little bit less of a bump, um, but getting also a little bit more continuous transmission in the inter epidemic years. If we look at cattle, because this is again, this is now cattle raised by pastoralists, so they're a little bit more like the wildlife in that they have longer lifetimes. So, say, for example, the Maasai would consider them investment in and use them for, say, blood and milk products and not so much for meat. Um, you get less drastic fluctuations, oops, but still much more drastic fluctuations than you saw in the wild ungulates. Um, and this is a, a mixed flock of um, sheep, goats, and cattle. I didn't show you the goats because they're pretty similar to this sheep, but my legends have changed now. So the top graph is actually just the total abundance for the cattle in, in light blue, the sheep in uh, sort of the orangey goldenrod, and the goats in gray. And you can see what's interesting here is this really synchronizes their dynamics because they're sharing the same pathogen. And that means that sort of this aspect of how the immunity affects the, um, the inferior epidemic aspects of the pathogen and the pathogen's persistence in the system is changed by being in a suite of hosts versus being in the in single monoculture hosts, which I've shown you up to this point. Um, and then again, you can sort of see that we're getting, again, sort of these different epidemic peaks, but now we're getting some strange structure here where actually we're holding up in this first rainy peak here, but getting it in the second. And so some of these variations are a little bit still I'm sort of puzzling through them. Um, but I think it's important to realize that sort of this multi-host system really can change how this works. Uh, and then this is just to show you, these are sort of the epidemic peaks. I, I'm a little bit curious about sort of one getting these sort of elbows of sort of free lead up expeditions. And I think that's just because some of these inter-epidemic periods are so long that we're getting fully susceptible populations. But again, it's showing the sort of interesting synchrony of the system between these species that actually are having, would individually have very different dynamics. And I think you know, so again, these are, I think there's some quantitative work I need to still do to get these parameterized right in the way I believe them, but I've been sort of playing with that recently, and so I trust the qualitative results here, that the composition of the ungulate community can really alter the dynamics, and that different species have different branching rearing practices, leading to different levels of herd immunity. And this has really important implications for how the disease progresses through systems whether they're managed or what. And I think that's a really important consideration to make in. And that, that can be really important in thinking about how we go into sort of land use change. So this is kind of, my land use change models are somewhat similar but a little bit more complicated in terms of number of species. And so the idea here is that multi-host systems are not additive of single host systems, right? They have very, the nonlinear dynamics and the tipping points really change when you have these multi-host systems. So, Changing gears a little bit, but I'm going to come back to a modeling framework that is actually somewhat similar, that's very multi-host. Um, we'll go look at land use change and talk about some of the ego health more broadly work on this idea of land use change and disease ecology, and why this <coughs> is important for disease ecology. I'm going to talk a bit about the Deep Forest Project of um, the USAID PREDICT. This is mostly work done under sort of the predict first PREDICT um, funding, um, although we're continuing to sort of finalize some of the results under PREDICT. Two. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, theoretical examination of transient dynamics from land use change. So why is land use change an important issue for disease ecology? Well, I think we've heard a fair bit about how A, it's just happening a lot in the world. It has important implications for conservation. Um, it's one of the major human habitat. Um, alterations in the world, or one of the major human alterations of the world outside of climate change. It's also much more often able to link it directly to what's going on, because climate change is often one of these things that's a strong driver of everything everywhere, and this it's hard to do anything but correlational studies on it. Um, 
And I think it's really, and it's also been one of the key drivers in the Jones et al. hotspots paper of um, disease emergence. And so the Deep Forest Project actually is trying to look at um, the, uh, um, across a land use change gradient from relatively pristine habitats to um, fragmented habitats to fully, fairly disturbed habitats, um, although not so much urban habitats yet. Um, what happens with these disease dynamics? And again, I'm going to come back to some, a little bit more of my own work on sort of this, these, what happens, what are some of the theories of the, how the ecology changes through this. So again, this is talking about land use change. So this is Brunei in a very pristine area many years ago, and then this is sort of, which is actually relatively unaffected, and this is brought to Brunei near the sort of border of Sarawak, Malaysia, and you can see that there's really some stark land use change gradients. And this is the Jones et al. data sort of summarized for drivers of wildlife and zoonotic diseases. And this shows you somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of um, emerging wildlife zoonotic diseases are driven by land use change. Um, and there's many mechanisms that su suggest why um, land use change might drive um, the emergence of diseases. And there's, they're, they sort of work in slightly different ways. But one of the key problems is that they're, is they're often confounded since human ecology and action is common to both. Right? And that's often one of these things we struggle with understanding the effects of anthropogenic change. We don't have just one thing happening at once. So the novel pathogen pool hypothesis is fairly simple. Um, is wildlife and non-perturbed areas harbor pathogens, right? And they may be unknown pathogens to which humans and associates, so this can mean anything from domestic animals like cows, to pets like, or work animals like dogs, to sort of peri-domestic pests like rats, right, um, have not yet been exposed. And so in some sense, Rift Valley fever virus is one of these, right, our introduction of cattle and sheep and goats and, and farming to a larger extent it, an expansion in Africa includes this. Nema virus, where people are in forests where fruit bats have been for years, and particularly in the case of the Malaysian Nipa outbreak, Nipa virus outbreaks, where it was actually driven by swine farms and mango plantations in concert with fruit bats. And even HIV and, this, and the bushmeat trade sort of involved this idea of essentially, you know, you've got a naive human who goes into this intent, in, into this forest that has some diseases that may be naturally occurring and comes out infected with something new and novel that we haven't seen before. And so one of the ideas, about, one of the important things about this novel pathogen pool hypothesis is what we want to do is, okay, given, so if we have some sort of pathogen diversity, right, so this is sort of the simple logic that, okay, there's some pathogen diversity there, we don't know what it is, some portion of those pathogens have some chance of spilling over to people, given the chance, opportunities, the right evolutionary trajectory, what, how can we predict that? And, you know, we don't have a great database on exactly where every pathogen that we don't know about is on Earth, which, you know, in, in and of itself is sort of said it. But so one of the things people look to to predict that is host diversity. So you look at, okay, what's mammal diversity look like across the globe? And, you know, some sort of average number of viruses per mammal, you sort of think that those drive, might drive the diversity of pathogens. Um, maybe there's some aspects of host life history trace that you could add into there. Maybe there's some aspects of climatic variables that explain things. But the, there's a lot more data needed to sort of really make this a, a, a more grounded working hypothesis on how it works. But I think the sort of prima facie ideas that make sense to most of us still. Um, and so we're trying to kind of look into this by the Deep Forest Project. So test, you know, some of these ideas about mechanisms underlying disease emergence, how many viruses are out there, what animals carry them, how are people involved, what are the interfaces between humans and these animals, is there anything we can do to stop them emerging, and you know, can we think about how this might sort of interact with conservation issues and conservation benefits. And so we're interested in viral diversity and mammal diversity and ecosystem use and people along this bridge. So the methods include um, sort of deep forest sampling. So we have intact, intermediate, and sort of non-intact sites sort of along the land use development gradient. Um, so we were working in South America and Brazil, um, in Africa and Uganda, and Asia 
um, in Malaysia and each of these areas. Um, there was some talk of expanding to Mex Mexico. Um, unfortunately, just given funding regimes and whatnot, um, USAID's focus is really much more on Africa and Asia. Um, and we're focusing on three wildlife groups that are known to be um, strong zoonotic reservoirs, um, which are primates, mostly non-human primates, mostly those <coughs> being closely related to us. They harbor a lot of pathogens to which can bind to our receptors and work with us fairly readily. Rodents and bats, bats, because right, there's been all this our bat special study on bats, a lot of recent emerging diseases have come out of them. But rodents have also had a few recently emerging diseases um, and have some reasons to think about that. And these groups also comprise about 70% global mammal to biodiversity. Um, so we're also doing some human contact surveys and I actually have some preliminary results to show you from those. So the idea is characterizing human ecology at the landscape le level in each of the three land use gradients, quantify contact with wildlife reservoirs, right? And quantifying contact will provide a basis of determining which human populations are at highest risk. And the idea behind this is there were a lot of assumptions in the Jones et al. hotspots paper that I think has really provoked some research, but we're sort of interested in understanding the mechanisms of disease emergency at contact. Um, so expected results from non-human data, data on biodiversity, data on viral diversity, um, and new virus discoveries. Um, human, there's some data on human behavior, land use, and wildlife contact, identifying high-risk groups, but identifying high-risk behaviors. So there's other hypotheses out there about how perturbation might affect things. So there's this idea about the dilution effect, right? Biodiversity might be broadly protected. Most, most species are poor amplifiers, but a few species are good amplifiers, so there's an amplification effect. And we often have found that these species are weak, um, right? And so this idea is, is there might be some ability is like of having biodiverse regions have some protection. And again, this gets to some ideas of, right, Okay, you've got all those novel pathogens in your nice pristine forest, but you know maybe they're they're working at low prevalences. They're not being very highly prevalent. They're not changing that much, maybe evolutionarily. You're not working with weedy species, and those species may have more general <coughs> pathogens. Right? If you've got a large diversity of very highly specialized pathogens, those might not provide the same risk as a more smaller handful, but a more generalist pathogens. And so a lot of those questions come up too. That there's some different predictions about how biodiversity relates to disease emergence. Um, and all these are also sort of focused on what I would call a quasi-equilibrium perspective, right? The idea that, you know, this is sort of what, okay, biodiversity is high here, and then this, this is what's going on, and biodiversity is low over there, this is what's going, going on. Um, but, you know, I think, so one of the ones I became interested in is sort of what the transient level was. But, uh, so I'm going to also talk a little bit first about how would this affect disease risk to humans, and how does land use change affect like the good human contact with animals. Um, and I'm going to make a request because I've noticed some people taking pictures. I would appreciate that nobody takes pictures of the results slides about people. <clears throat> and so I think, you know, it's interesting again to think about this. So both of these hypotheses have interested interesting points to make about how disease emergence happens, but it's not yet clear, I think, and I think a lot of work needs to be done to sort of figure out what makes these things risky, right? So novel pathogens will, exposure to new pathogens that we haven't been exposed to, perturbation hypothesis, there's some sort of disruption of endemic disease dynamics, right, sort of changes <coughs> that make the risk higher, right? Loss of biodiversity, loss of evolution effect, increases in amplification. And then they, these are get confounded because there's sort of common human processes to both. And so this so often comes into this question of our expectation. When are they, where and when is land use change most problematic, right? And so the idea is it could be when you first go into the forest and log it, that's really the danger of the moment. It could be that, you know, sort of when you've got people really utilizing heavily sort of partially disturbed areas and farming, but maybe a, a, consuming bush meat when um, food scarcity is an issue and food insecurity happens, creates a heightened risk, and you've got a decent enough population <coughs> size for local human-to-human -human transmission to be a greater problem. 
but you can also get concentrations of travel and flight risk and risk and to the global community when you're in urban areaized areas that are integrated across a larger landscape um, and then also may have access to international travel such as airports. So there's, I think this is still a big open question about exactly how all the different forces that go into disease risk integrate across the landscape and where is this risk located. And it may not always be the same, I think, for every disease either. But one of the things I wanted to sort of pursue further is this sort of idea of the perturbation hypothesis is a lot of it, I think, has been focused on what I call the quasi-equilibrium dynamics today. Right, this idea, okay, if you've got biodiversity, you lose it, you, you know, you diluted it here where you've had you, this dilution effect is protecting you, here where you've got high biodiversity, over here where you've depleted it, you've lost it. What, but what happens about around the actual perturbation when you're going in there and changing things? How does sort of changing disease composition change disease problems? And so this theoretical examination sort of inspired by what happens to sort of a pristine community is inspired by sort of a the potential site we were looking at in Mexico, looking at how across from um, disturbed um, to fragmented communities. And so we have, um, you've got see, the, the pristine communities here in green. Again, here they're fairly closely related. They're all sort of at the base of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. You've got the fragmented sites over here, and then the disturbed sites along here along a sort of a major roadway. So you can see sort of roughly here, more out of focus, that this is pristine, it's pretty much solid forest. Here you've kind of got some um, farms or plantations going on, and here you've got some more like a small village or a community that's trapped that is sort of a little bit more dense. Um, and so I did four scenarios and looking at two different, uh, one looking at a subset of species, one looking at a all species at all sites data from the data we have. And so the data we have was some data on species abundances, and for some of those species, we have rabies prevalence data. And so I, for the subset, I used relative abundance measures and informed the transmission rates from this rabies prevalence data. So I tried to essentially fit the equilibrium prevalence to what data I had by sort of um, fitting beta that way. Uh, and then for the all species data, what I essentially did is I used absolute abundance measures and estimated beta from body mass. So taking the body mass of these species, and this is something from, based on some work that Andy Dobson and Julio Galea did a long time ago, there is actually a relationship between transmission parameters and body mass. Um, so taking the body mass to use to predict the transmission rate for the species for which I didn't have the data. So you, again, this is sort of an inspired by trying to inform myself by realistic data so I sort of stay in interesting biolo and tr biologically true space but to get at some interesting mathematical so the model dynamics here are hopefully fairly simple. We have susceptibles and infected. Um, it's an SIS model, so individuals are going back to susceptible. That ended up being a minor mathematical necessarily tweak. I don't necessarily believe it's true for rabies, but um, the math was not working well if I didn't have some sort of um, equilibration by doing the SIS model. So we've got logistic growth for all N species, right, with some sort of fixed carrying capacity. Uh, and then I develop a who infects who matrix for the transmission. So there's always a transmission from every species to every other species. Um, so the carrying capacities are based on empirical abundance at one specific time, right? Team at time zero. I change from one habitat type to another. So I base the so I have the, uh, the carrying capacities are the abundances that we found on the pristine habitat at time zero. We suddenly switch it to fragmented habitat, and the carrying capacity switch to the observed abundances in that habitat type. All right. um, and then all of the other parameters remain the same in the model, except for this change in carrying capacity. Um, for everybody, I just we're all dealing with bat species, so I let the um, growth rates, the gamma rates, and um, the additional mortality and disease rates be the same for all species. And again, this data fits sort of on this empirical prevalence data. I made interspecific de um, betas depend on um, species, but I had one interspecific rate for everybody. So if you're, if you're transmitting from one bat species to another, it doesn't matter which two they are, it's the same. And again, this is all done because the amount of data I had to work with, trying to be inspired by this, 
but trying to also not overestimate parameters as much as possible from what I had. So just trying to essentially stretch the data I had into as much information into much as plausible scenario as I could get. So this is the relative abundance of the bat species with um, where we had rabies prevalence data. So this is, um, and I've got a table of the different bat species if you're not familiar with them, by sort of abbreviated them all by sort of three letters of genus, three letters of species name. The actual prevalences are down here, sort of ranging from about, I think 0.3 is the highest for car sow, um, down to sort of um, 0.1 something for um, stew lil. And you can see that, you know, some species are actually doing, like Carsau does actually better in this gray bar, which is the um, disturbed habitat. Um, and other species do better, like the lil, the pristine habitat, but there's kind of differences of that across this. Um, and, other species, and some species actually disappear entirely um, from certain habitats. And so this is just, this is a bit confusing. So in some ways it's good you saw the Rift Valley fever stuff already, because that was confusing, but you at least got one species at once. So these are just the number of infected individuals on this um, y-axis with time here. Zero is that this time point change when the, the perturbation happens, when um, we switch from pristine habitat over here to disturb over here. Right? So it's a sort of rapid one-time disturbance event. Um, and so these are the six species and the number of infected over here. And then this is the number affected in there. And then the solid red line here is the global prevalence of the disease across all species. Um, and it has a separate y-axis here. Um, and I think what this shows is right, we get some really different changes in who's prevalent, who's had in contributing the most number of infected individuals to the overall number of infected individuals in the population. We're getting this sort of um, quasi-cyclic behavior, and we're getting a little perturbation in the prevalence, you know, so both in global prevalence, both dips and upstarts in it. And so that suggests that, you know, this perturbation is actually changing who's infected, what the dynamics are, um, and changes the global prevalence for the disease in the system. So this is a bit different case. This is going from pristine to the fragment of habitat, so not actually quite as big a land use change, but we're getting a little bit more difference in terms of sort of who's infected, some individuals have completely disappeared. Again, not much change in the final equilibrium value of the global prevalence, but we are getting some quasi-cyclic behavior and seeing signs of that perturbation. So now I expanded it out and used the abundance of all the bat species is uh, the pristine, the fragmented, and the disturbed habitat sites you can see quite a bit of variation here. Again, this is where I don't have the prevalence data to work with, but I'm using body mass to sort of try and inform data. So this gets much more chaotic to look at. I haven't even bothered to label the individual species here. Because the really big perspective I want you to get here is A, that there is this pretty giant large perturbation now in this much more complicated community in terms of what happens to the global prevalence even though, again, it settles down at a somewhat similar global prevalence in the end. Or also, interestingly, right, there's a lot of different phases in who's up and who's down and sort of how these positive cycles are behaving, right, across this time period where you get this disturbance. And so finally, going from pristine to fragmented with this one, right, what now what we see is a really interesting case, to me the most interesting case, is that we get a perturbation in the global prevalence, but that act, it actually settles back down at a higher overall prevalence now. Um, and so I think this is very interesting in terms of thinking about actually that tr those transient dynamics, that motive, moment of perturbation, can actually change what happens with the disease. And it may settle back down to a similar prevalence, or it may settle down back down to a, a, um, a higher prevalence. But things are happening when you make that perturbation, that perturbation itself can really change what happens with your disease dynamics. Um, and so the idea is that changing community structure when land use change occurs can alter both the long-term prevalence of the multi-host pathogen um, and can induce short-term perturbations in that pathogen. 
both of which are really changing the likelihood of spillover, particularly when you've got those sort of what if you're getting these sort of changes going on when people are actually there changing the landscape and using it maybe more intensely. That maybe argues for that that moment of landscape change is really important, both in terms of how human contact's working and in terms of how the disease dynamics are working for pathogen emergence. And just sort of this overall conclusion I want you to get from this is that you know, the ecological structure of communities and populations can really have big effects on how the dynamics of disease work and affect things like spillover risk, emergence, and persistence of these diseases. And I think one of the questions also becomes is then what, what is the functional risk we're worried about? You know, in terms of, say, looking at those bat species, you know, are we worried about the global prevalence? Is that our best metric? Is the total number of infected vigils the best metric? And it's a lot of those things that are also, I think, still sort of not yet clear, I think, as we think about these things. Um, and I think one of the ones that's become clear to me is sort of reviewing the literature, and this is the sort of review I'm working on, and, but I think also integrates this talk, is that this suggests conserving areas benefits human health. And I think there's been a lot of literature that suggests that. But I think one of the things that I think is still fairly unaddressed in the literature is when the change is unavoidable, right? If we're going to provide food security to people in Bangladesh, we, may, we can't, or Africa, we can't leave all the intact forests intact necessarily, right? And so how do we better manage or restore ecological systems to protect both human and non-human species in that context, right? What do we do? Is it better to say, like I know we were talking over dinner the other night, right? Then Costa Rica, a lot of land areas have been protected, but the other chunks of it have really been intensively used. Is that the best strategy, or is it better to spread your um, usage of the landscape more lightly across parts of the landscape, but then have to use more of it, right? And I think those are some very real trade-offs people will be facing. Um, and I think it really is trying to understand how that integrates with disease dynamics and emergence risk is going to be important in the future. Um, and with that, I'd like to do this, you know, giant thank you, particularly to you know, USA Predict, um, but also some work from the Fogarty International Center, um, um, some of the influenza stuff um, that I've done in the past, um, and also the, the great caveat that, you know, it, this does not represent our present position in the USA. Um, also, my colleagues at the Eco Health Alliance, Peter Dazak, Billy Koresh, Chris Murray, who's um, now in the of London, Elizabeth Lowe, Carlos and Brenna Correa, um, Luciana Mendoza, um, Catherine Alcalva, um, and Evelyn Luciana, who's the person who makes all this money stuff actually work properly. Also, colleagues at University of California Davis, um, UCLA, um, and um, colleagues at the University of Davis.